So Lauren, good morning and thank you so much for being with the Yoga for Unity program, making the time from Australia to talk to us about mental health and yoga. Okay. And, thank you so uh, much for having me here. So uh, if you can tell us a little bit more about yourself, you know, I know you that you are a clinical psychologist, a coach mm -hmm. and also a yoga teacher. So what do you do with all this? And how do we decide, you know, how, how did it start? Did it start with your psychology first and yoga later? Yeah. How did you combine all this? They actually really started side by side. So I was studying psychology um, at, in Australia at ANU and Australian National University. And then I went on exchange to the University of British Columbia in Canada in my undergraduate studies. And it was in Vancouver that I discovered yoga for the first time and I fell in love with it right away and so I was practicing yoga and I was studying psychology at the same time it took like I had this kind of feeling inside of me that they would come together that yoga and psychology were were a really um you know a really good fit and that yoga could really help with with mental health but I didn't know how and I didn't know anyone else that was doing it so there was no one that I could go and ask about how these um how these worlds fitted together but I you know, I, I continued my studies to become a psychologist and I continued practicing yoga. And over the years, I've become to understand more and more how these, how these worlds fit together. And so um, about the yoga part, what, mm -hmm. what is, I'm, I mean, I'm, I guess that you have studied many styles, but what is the style that maybe for you is the most relevant and that you use mostly in your classes? Gosh, I don't think I can say that one style is more relevant than the other. Like when I think about my very first yoga class that I did in, in Vancouver, it was a Kundalini yoga class. Um, I don't practice that anymore because personally, um, I, I don't, you know, that, that style doesn't light me up, but I know that it does for many people. But that's where I started. What really hooked me into yoga was Ashtanga yoga. And I practiced that in my 20s. Um, Is that as a student and then I practiced um, then I became I went to India and I studied to become an Ashtanga yoga teacher in um, India and really in my 20s I think that's just really what I needed my needed to you know use up that energy and being still and doing more subtle practices um, I just wasn't ready for I needed that more dynamic that more kind of gross um, physical side of yoga to really engage my mind and engage my interest. So I practiced Ashtanga yoga and I taught Ashtanga yoga um, for quite some time, really until I had kids. So 15 years ago, um, I became pregnant and my practice changed. It became a lot more gentle, a lot more intuitive. Um, and I sometimes practice Ashtanga yoga now. And by Ashtanga yoga, I mean like the um, the Tabi Joyce's style of Ashtanga yoga. Um, but particularly in the last 15 years, my practice has become more and more gentle, more and more subtle, more and more embodied, less about you have to practice these postures in these ways and, and getting it right or being able to do it properly and more about listening to what my body needs in each moment and practicing in a way that's nourishing and supportive of that. So... Um, My practice has evolved over the years from very dynamic um, to much more, you know, subtle and intuitive. And my teaching has changed in that way as well. But I also don't want to say that one style is better than the other because even though I don't practice Ashtanga yoga now, I did think it's it, like it is really what I needed at that time in my life. Um, and so I think there's different ways of practicing to meet the different stages of our life and also the different needs that we have um, At, at different times but the way that I when I teach yoga now I call it embodied yoga and um, you know that's not any kind of special brand I just made up <laughs> made up that word to describe the way that I like to teach and the way that I like to practice which is practicing in a way that supports us to be at home in our bodies and to have this interoceptive awareness to be present with our unfolding internal experience as we're practicing. So you use the word uh, interoception. What what does that mean? What is it? So interoception. My understanding of interoce interoception is the awareness or the intention with what's unfolding internally. I think so often our focus is outward 
we're, we're aware of what's going on out outside in the world but we can turn that focus inwards and bring out bring our focus um, internally and be aware of what's unfolding as sensation in the body and you know I kind of liken it to scuba diving I don't know if, if if you've tried scuba diving but when I the first time I did scuba diving or even snorkeling it's like you're in the water and you're looking around at all the you know the boat and the things that you can see and then you put on your snorkel or you put on your scuba diving gear and you go down under the water and there's this whole other world down there. There's there's fish and there's coral and there's like, I don't know what you call them, like things moving like this. And it's this whole other world that you would never know if you didn't put your goggles on and go underwater. And for me, this is what like an embodied meditation practice or embodied yoga practice is like. It's like putting on our goggles and going underwater and seeing this whole different world under the water. When we practice in that way, bringing our attention to our internal landscape and having that interoceptive awareness. It's like there's this whole other world that's going on internally within us that we forget about because the world is so loud and draws our attention. And I think it's getting even more and more, more so. There's so many things that are pulling our attention externally that it's this real radical act to have a practice that helps us to take our focus inwards. And there's a whole world that unfolds within us when we do. So I, I actually don't think yoga is for everyone. And by that, I mean yoga is for everyone who is interested in doing yoga. Not everybody's interested in it. And if you prefer a different way to um, nourish your body, breath, and mind, go for it. Maybe it's Tai Chi, maybe it's scuba diving, maybe it's walking. So um, it's not necessarily everybody can do yoga 100%. Um, but yeah, I would only suggest doing it if you're drawn to it. And if you're not drawn to it, maybe try something else. And maybe another time in your life, you'll be drawn to it and, and come back to it. Um, so having said that, yes, asana. Oh, sorry, my, um, my computer's making noises. Um, asana or the postures or the physical aspect of yoga is only one part of yoga. And it is what we see on Instagram, these like, I don't know, like handstands and fancy legs behind your head, pose on a cliff in a bikini. Like this is the kind of stuff we see um, on Instagram. And, you know, that's not a very accurate represent. That's a very small part of what yoga is. And if that brings people into yoga, great. Um, but it is not It is not the entirety of, of yoga. There is so much more to it. So if you're interested in trying yoga, one way to think about where to start would be what's my intention with practicing yoga what do i want to get out of it and there's so many different reasons to come to yoga right so it might be i want to reduce my stress uh, i want to find a community of like-minded people i want to connect with god i want you know a great six pack <laughs> um i want you know to learn how to regulate my nervous system so the first step I would say would be to think about, well, why do I want to practice yoga? What do I want to get out of it? And then once you have some clarity about why you want to practice, that's going to help you to decide where you're going to go to find that yoga. So if you want, um, let's just say you're feeling anxious and you want to learn how to calm down and that might be you know I think that's a pretty common uh, reason to start yoga we might be feeling anxious and we might be feeling stressed and we hear yoga is good for stress or yoga is good for anxiety and so with that uh, you know coming at it from that place I'm stressed or I'm anxious and I want to learn how to calm down my nervous system we'll find a class or a practice that's going to support us with that now, even then, there's still a million, like there's so many different options there. And for some people, when we're feeling anxious and stressed, we want to start with something um, something that's dynamic and then helps us to calm down. Because while, you know, while we know that when we're feeling stressed or anxious, one of the best things we can do is relax and breathe deeply. It can actually be really hard when you're feeling really anxious or really wound up or you're on the go, or life feels overwhelming. It can be very hard just to stop. So we might say if you're feeling anxious or stressed, going to a restorative yoga class or doing a yoga nidra practice or learning, um, learning how to meditate would be a really great place, uh, really great thing to do. And actually all of those things I think would be really beneficial. But it might 
be very difficult to start there because if you're feeling anxious and your mind is going a million miles an hour, to lie still in a yoga ninja practice for half an hour might be very triggering, very boring. You might not be able to sit still for that long. I know the first time I tried yoga nidra in an ashram in Australia, again, I was in my in my early 20s and I thought it was the most boring practice in the whole world. Um, now I love it. Like it's it's a big part of my practice now. But back then um, I just felt it excruciating and boring and I didn't, I didn't want to practice it. Um, and it's just, it just wasn't meeting me where I was at. And, and so I think that's really important. We want to meet ourselves where we are. And, you know, this is true. If you're a yoga teacher listening in as well, you want to meet your students where they are. And then you want to support yourself to come to where you want to be. So if you're anxious or stressed in yoga, we might call that vidasic. And so we might meet ourselves with something more dynamic. So it might be a vinyasa class or a more dynamic breath practice or a gentle asana practice. And then we gradually, we gradually start to, to calm down. So um, if you're if you're feeling stress or anxiety, you might want to go straight to a more restorative meditative practice. For some people, that really works. Uh, for other people, you might want to start with something more dynamic, like an Ashtanga practice or, or a gentle, um, a gentle asana, um, uh, you know, physical practice. Something that's going to um, slow down toward the end of class. Here in Australia, people sometimes teach these classes called. Um, yang to yin i don't i don't know if that's in in other parts of uh, parts of the world and i like that structure because it starts off quite dynamic and then it moves to more uh, to a more gentle class and i think if we're feeling a lot of stress and anxiety that can be a great way to meet us where we are with a more dynamic practice and then slowly kind of quieten it down so we come to a more sattvic state by the end of class so it's like my teacher used to say you have to run with the train and then catch the train hop in the train and from within you have to break down and try to slow yeah, it down i love that yeah yeah i love that and as you're saying that what i'm thinking like that's true in a practice or in a class but i can also say it in my own life that's true in a lifetime as well like in my 20s it was this you know i was running to catch catch that train and then as you know 20 years down the track it's like slowing <laughs> slowing down and becoming i guess more sattvic or more um calm and intuitive as I'm as I'm aging. So you founded the Center for Body Mind uh, Wellness. You using the body to also address the mind problems. I would like you to tell me how do I choose as a student, how do I choose a yoga class that suits me? What would be the criteria that would define what is a good class for me? How can I do that? And it can take a while to find a class that's a good fit or a teach, like a teacher that's a good fit or a style that's a good fit or an environment that it's a good fit. So I really encourage people to try out a few different places and, and find the one that resonates um, for you the most. And so initially when you're looking for a class, like firstly, you can have a look in our directory again because there's amazing teachers that really, you know, people who sign up for our training are really um you know, really dedicated to this. And it's really, um, really kind of a heartfelt connection with supporting people with mental health challenges. So that's a good place to start. Another good place to start is to ask for recommendations. Ask, ask a friend, if you have a therapist, ask your therapist if they have any recommendations. And, you know, I think um, like word of mouth is a great, a great um, place. And also look at people's websites or Instagram or, you know, have a look at what they're sharing, read their bio, read their, their training, read about the style of yoga that they're sharing, what they're interested in, look at their posts on social media and see if it's a good fit for you because, um, and you want to be looking for both, you know, their training and make sure that they're, they have, they have um, good training also about what they're offering in the class and if it fits in with your intention. So we thought we, you know, we started by saying, consider your intention as you read through the class description or their, you know, or their beliefs about yoga or what they share, check to see if that fits in with your intention. Um, but the style of yoga isn't everything. One really important part of um, any kind of relationship or any kind of um practice or the endeavor that we that we embark upon is the relationship the relational part of it this is true of um, therapy as well you can go and see the i'm a clinical psychologist you can go see the best clinical psychologist in the world but if it's not a good fit 
um, the research tells us that therapy is not going to work. So there has to be kind of an interpersonal connection as well. So as well as looking at the style of yoga they teach and their education, you also want to just have a sense if you like them, like if you feel drawn drawn to the teacher or not, if there's that relational um, aspect of it. And then go and try a class. Bring a friend along for some moral support if you need to. And know that you have no obligation to continue. You know, I think sometimes we feel like we have an obligation to the teacher to keep going and we show up for somebody else, but we absolutely do not if we come and try it out. And if it's not right for you, it's actually not even personal. It's not that the teacher's a bad teacher. It's just that it's not a good fit for you. So you don't need to feel guilty about saying this isn't for me. Um, And go and find somebody else. You could even, actually, this is what I encourage my counselling clients to do. In, in the first session with someone, I always say, let's, do, let's check in at the end and make sure that this, um, this is a good fit for you. And if it isn't, I really invite you to tell me and I'll see if I can help you find someone else um, who would be a better fit. So I think it take, like if the teacher offers out an invitation, that's one thing. I think, I think it would take a lot of courage from somebody to go and say that to their teacher. I don't like your class. Who else could I see? Um, that might not be the easiest thing to do. But if, if, you're, if you're up for that, then that could be an option as well. Yeah, so firstly, I would check in with your intention as well. And, you know, after a class, did this did this actually meet my intention? So maybe my intention was to regulate my nervous system. Did I feel more regulated after the class or, or did I not? If my intention was more about community and I wanted to meet like-minded people, did I get a chance to actually com- like have a chat with somebody after class or can you see the potential for that community to happen? Um, so again, checking back in about why you're practicing and seeing if it meets that need is one thing so that's more of an intellectual level I also think like on an embodied level we can we often feel drawn to something or you know want to move away for something so just notice in in yourself do I feel like I want to keep doing this or do I feel like no this this is really not for me and so it's not even really a thinking thing it's just more of an embodied experience am I drawn to this or am I you know wanting to move away from it and really listening to that. And I think this is one of the things that we develop with an embodied practice, like we talked about, um, like an interceptive or an embodied practice. The more that we do that, the more that we get familiar with our internal landscape and we can start to listen to those messages of being drawn to something or wanting to step away from it. So I think like practicing like that helps us to develop that. Um, but even so, I feel like we, we, we do have these natural reactions and to listen to that rather than dismissing it we don't need to know why um, but a sense of being drawn to it or moving away from it and so if for any reason you feel like stepping away from it listen to that and step away and that could be for so many different reasons it might be that there's not a great connection with the teacher for example it might be it's too dynamic and you want something more gentle or it's too gentle and you want something more dynamic it might be that that the space doesn't feel safe people are um you know yoga teachers are offering like you're touching people without asking for consent and you don't want that or they're um using language that's very um um like very kind of like a dictator rather than invitational for example like there can be many many different things that go into into a yoga class that can make it not really feel like a safe like a safe space or you know maybe everybody is you know have you know five hundred dollar outfits from lululemon and perfect hair and makeup and that doesn't feel like your vibe um for whatever reason there could be like so many different reasons but really listen to your body really listen to what that kind of natural feeling is do you feel drawn to it or do you feel like stepping like stepping away so what, can you give me an example? What are those body signs that I have to listen to to know if that class is a good class for me? Is there, you know, something that uh, you feel inside? Yeah. yeah. Something that, you know, if you could give some examples, uh, you know, in your experience of uh, how, how does my body tell me that it is okay or not okay and I, I can walk away from a class? So I think um, the more that we practice this interoceptive awareness, the more that we get to know our internal world, the more kind of attuned we are to what's happening. And I don't think, I don't know what it's like um, growing up in in India or in France, but I, I know growing up, 
in Australia, in my experience anyway, it's we're not taught to listen to our intuition. We're not taught to listen to the messages um, of our body. At least I wasn't. I'm trying to give my, my children a different experience of that. But when I was growing up, that was not something. It was all very academic and, you you know, you, thought, you think things through or you think about what you should do or you shouldn't do and you want to please other people rather than doing what's really, really important for you. And I think the more that we practice yoga, um, and when I say yoga, I mean and meditation, you know, the, the full spectrum of that we get. And, and yoga nidra is a really great way to do that. We get really well acquainted with our internal landscape and we can start to listen to how that unfolds. Now, um, in terms of what it what is it actually, I think it's different for everybody. But for me and, and for many people that I've talked about this with, if you're deciding between two options, for example, like should I go to this yoga class or not? Like should I go... For like that, 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 like that could be a really um, maybe simple example. And often, if it's the answer is a yes for me and for many people I spoke to, there's there's a kind of a feeling of expansiveness. And if it's a no, there's often a feeling of contraction. Um, for me, when it's a big no, I get a I get a sore throat. Like my throat my throat contracts. And this is not the same for everyone, but this is this is my kind of internal measure if something's not right if I know that I'm choose, I can feel that I'm choosing a wrong path or it's a difficult conversation that I'm happening my throat will, will really contract that's a really strong feeling in my body um, so that's my kind of like signature feeling um, and but I but I think for many people there is this kind of contraction versus expansion and so if you think about um, you go to a class and you're you you're afterwards like was that was that a good class for me or not when you imagine yourself there or you think about this class, is there a lightness or an expansion in your body or is there a contraction and a heaviness in your body? So that could be one kind of measure of, of how to listen to your body and, and make a decision. And I think we can build that capacity. Um, this is something that really lights me up that I'm that I get really excited about is about building this capacity to trust our intuition or trust our inner wisdom or our body knowing or whatever we want to call it and you know just like we can train a muscle through repetition I feel like we can train this capacity in ourselves. we all have it within us that's I think I hear from some people that they don't feel like they have this but I but but I really believe that we all have it we just lose our connection to it um, and so we can reconnect with that and nurture it, nourish it, like water that seed of intuition through repetition and through practice. And so it might be, you know, we talk about it in a yoga class, in the yoga context, but it also might be, um, you know, when I drive home from work today, shall I take the highway or the scenic way? And just kind of feel into which way you want to drive. When I get dressed in the morning, um, shall I put on jeans or a dress? And don't think about it, like just kind of feel in or jeans or, you know, like a tracksuit because it's, it's more comfortable. Or, you know, when I'm cooking dinner, not what I should eat and what will, you know, you know, that I feel like I should eat, but what am, what am I feeling more drawn to? Um, and so use, using this kind of expansion and contraction or whatever that, whatever that is for you uh, to make, these kind of small decisions throughout your day, decisions that don't really have a big impact. It's not like, shall I leave this relationship or stay in it? Or shall I start a new career or not? Like these are my, or shall I have a baby or not have a baby or move to India or, or not? Like these are kind of bigger decisions that we can definitely be led uh, by that inner knowing, but they have bigger implications. That. So I think if we start with decisions that have very little impact, like very kind of the implications are not great, we can just try it out. We can do it as an experiment and, um, you know, start to have the felt lived experience of being able to trust that, that inner knowing. So being able to trust, that's something I wanted to come to when I was listening to you, you know, having this capacity to yeah. feel that, you know, I should that's follow simple. myself. Yeah. Follow, follow what I and that's feel. a really simple point. It's, it's huge as well because so many of us are disconnected not only disconnected from that, but also don't trust it. 
And I think part of that is that we're taught not to trust it. We're taught to trust the experts or what we're sold in advertising or the teachers or our parents or the, the health professionals as opposed to kind of coming back to ourselves and trusting what we know to be true. I also think if we've been through a, a traumatic experience or we're experiencing depression or anxiety, we can lose, that can also um, be part of lose, losing a trust in our own inner wisdom, our own um, inner knowing, our intuition. And so by doing this, we're reclaiming that for ourselves, and there's so much power in that. So your uh, expertise is really in mental health, you know, taking care of people who've had uh, a trauma or anxiety or depression. And uh, this is something that yoga can address. I would like you to give to uh, people who are listening to us maybe a, an example mm -hmm. of what are the asanas that uh, you use maybe for, in a particular, uh, for a particular uh, problem, you know, what, what techniques or practices you would use uh, to address that issue? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we can use um, asana, like in, in terms of building trust in ourselves, asana or the yoga postures could be one way, one way to build that. And as we, as we practice and we learn how to we learn to trust our body. Maybe we do a difficult posture like a, a tree pose, for example, and we learn um, that we can that we can be strong and we can wobble um, and that that's okay and then we can find our centre again and we can fall out of um, a tree pose and then be able to, you know, come back into it and not, you know, not beat ourselves up or um, get caught up in the fact that we that we fell over or that, or that we wobbled and that over time we develop more of a strength and we can hold it for a few more breaths for example I think that can really help us to um, to build up the trust and the strength um, and in doing so in doing so the confidence so you've been now uh, speaking about uh, safe space mm. safe space uh, for practice and uh, I've been really uh, lucky to follow your to be part of your online teaching mental health away yoga and uh, I have learned a lot of simple things as a yoga teacher, how to make sure that I welcome people properly, that being on time is also, uh, you know, an important factor to make that space, that space feel safe. So I, 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 uh, I would like to know, you know, from you right now, without telling us everything, I know it would take a few hours, you know, but if you could just resume, you know, the, the most important yeah. point for you that you would like to give to the teachers on how to create a safe yeah. space. As yoga teachers, creating a safe container for our students is one of the most important things we can do to make, you know, to support the mental health of our students. Um, yes, there are so many different yoga practices, asana, pranayama, meditation, all different practices that can be supportive of mental health. But if I had to like say the most important thing, it would be creating a safe container for all that to, to happen in, um, whether we call it a safe space or a safe container or a brave, brave spaces. There's, you know, lots of different words that, um, you know, have different nuances for a very uh, similar thing. Um, okay. So there's so many different ways that we can do that. And like you said, they're, they're often just small tweaks that we make um, to our teaching. Um, I think one of the one of the one of the things that I've been sitting with a lot lately that that um, I think is really powerful is having a warm and welcoming presence. So as you invite your students in, have that warm kind of connection with 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 your students and be present with them and be interested um, and be curious about their lives and how things are unfolding for them. Um, as teachers, like if we are feeling stressed or if we're feeling anxious. That, that can often come across as being a bit cold or a little bit removed, even though that's not our intention. But if we can kind of reach through that with, with warmth and with a heartfelt connection to our students, I think that can be really powerful. We all have this desire within us to be seen and heard. And I think the, like the warmth in the manner that we connect with other people really communicates or they really get a live, felt, embodied experience of being seen and heard when we show up with, with warmth. Um, some other ways is about the language that we use. So being really invitational in our language, offering lots of choice. Um, and so with invitational, I mean, um, so instead of telling your students to raise their arms, inviting them to raise their arms or 
noticing how it feels um, when they try something. You know, some some yoga styles and, you know, Ashtanga can be like this as well. Every, it's almost like a performance. Everyone does it at the same time. It looks beautiful from the outside. Um, but, you know, that's, yoga isn't about looking beautiful from the outside. So we want to really um, encourage our students to practice in a way that feels nourishing for them. So adapting the practice in any way, doing something different if they would prefer. Um, so offering like invitation to try something rather than demand, but also choice to be able to adapt and change and, and show up uh, how, however works for them. And, you know, the final one would be around touch and consent. Um, there's a lot of touching without consent that goes on in yoga. Um, in Australia, having spent nine months studying yoga in India, I know that it, that's, that's, that's true, at least it was uh, 15 years ago in, in India as well, where I was, where I was um, studying. Um, so you don't... I mean, it's, it's an interesting one because some in people in trauma sensitive worlds will often say, don't touch your students. And I know there's there's some lineages of yoga where, where touch isn't offered as well, having studied at um, the Shivananda Ashram in London. That was very, you know, there was no touch that was, that was happening there. So we may not touch our students at all and not offer any hands on assists. And that can be great, particularly if you're working with a population of students who you know uh, have a history of trauma, particularly sexual trauma, I would suggest offering absolutely no touch at all, staying on your mat, not walking around, being very clear um, that there's no touch involved. However, other people really appreciate touch. They appreciate um, having that, that hands on assistance uh, from the teacher and if that's something that you're offering, I would suggest one that you're very clear. So it's in your class description that's that's on offer. So students can opt in or opt out of that. And two, make sure that you always ask. Never, ever, ever touch somebody without their clear consent. So that could be asking them. It also could be using consent tokens. Actually, I have some here. Um. Sally, you probably have some of these from the training. Yeah, so these are consent tokens that we make. Those are part of the, the training that we offer. One side it says yes, please. The other side it says no, thanks. And so this is a way to um, communicate and to start conversations about touch and consent. Um, because, you know, I don't, I don't know how it, how it goes in India, Dolly, but in Australia often in yoga studios, people will ask but not in a real way. It doesn't seem to me to be a real way. So they'll say at the beginning of the class, if you don't want to be touched, let me know. And, you know, it's very difficult to say no in that situation. And so using these consent tokens or, you know, making your own consent cards at home that just say yes or no on each side and printing it out um, really allows people to communicate that in a more nuanced way. I always suggest putting it on no. So giving your student, every student one of these, placing it on their mat with a no side facing up. And so then students need to opt in to touch rather than opt out. So when you ask students, um, when you say, let me know if you don't want to be touched, you kind of, as a student, you have to stand out. Like it's a lot to say, no, don't touch me. You're kind of making a, a deal out of it that can be very difficult because there is a natural power imbalance in the yoga class and it can be difficult to stand out. Um, so if you are doing it verbally, I would suggest saying, say, let me know if you would like touch. So people need to put their hand up or they need to opt in to touch rather than opt out. Or if you're using tokens or cards Put them on no so people need to turn it to yes if they need to and one of the reasons that i like using these is that you can change them between postures as well so maybe one posture you would really appreciate um touch uh, maybe your teacher's offering a head massage at the end of the class and you're like yeah count me in for that but do not touch me in any other <laughs> any other posture for example so you can switch it as you go between between classes sorry between postures or between practices so it just happened that uh, you are going to conduct um, more courses, you know, online, on site. You, you're starting one very soon. Would you like to tell people who would be interested? And I really recommend that uh, yoga teachers uh, uh, take this course to refine their teaching. So would you like to tell us a bit more about this course and maybe how I can attend? Maybe if I'm in Australia or if I can take it online? 
Yeah, sure. So when I started this training, um, we started with a hybrid model. So we would do the lectures and things online and then we come together for, for a weekend and practice together and, and, and refine. But then COVID happened, of course, so we needed to cancel it. We had trainings in different parts of the world. And so we canceled them and we moved it all online into 100% online training. And, yeah, in, um, oh, it's not even two weeks, in one week. On the 6th and 7th of May, which, you know, by the time this comes out, maybe it's only a day or two away, we're, we're doing the first um, training in Byron Bay in my hometown in Australia. And then we're going to be offering another online version of the training in, in late June. We don't have the exact dates yet, but they'll be up on our website soon, mentalhealthaboutyoga.com. Um, yeah, so if any yoga teachers uh, would like to come and take the training, that would just be, that would be amazing. Um, I think, like... What I really want to share is that the what we're sharing in the training, and, and hopefully that really shone through when you took the training too, Dolly, is that it's not a new style of yoga. It's dip principles that you can bring to any style of yoga that you're already teaching, whether it's a very dynamic style, where it, whether it's a very gentle style, whether you're working in a more specialized setting, like maybe in a rehab center or a hospital or a community center, or if you're working in a yoga studio or a high-end retreat space, you can whatever style that you're teaching and whatever kind of um, place that you're working in, you can adapt these principles in different ways um, to the um, the place that you're teaching in and the students that, that you're working with. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, we are getting to the end of uh, this uh, session together. I would like to know if you would like to add anything uh, that you've not been able to share, anything that comes to your mind. Um, what would I like to share? Just that it's it's so great that you're offering this, um, Dolly, and all, all the team that I know are behind you to be able to share your love of yoga, which really it really shines through. Um, and that you know, yoga can be a really great way to support our mental health. I think you know there was some research done. It was in Australia, but I think this is probably true globally that around eighty percent of people come to yoga for mental health reasons, whether uh, it's stress or anxiety. Um, and so it is, you know, really, um, we're really understanding how powerful yoga can be for, for our mental health. It can be so helpful, but we do need to find, as, as students, we need to find a teacher and a style that works for us. So um, really take the time to find one that works for you. Don't push on with something that doesn't feel right. Try something else until you land on the right um, right teacher and the right style and also for yoga teachers how important it is that we actually do understand mental health because if you think about it eight out of ten if you have a, a class with ten students eight of them will probably be there for um for mental health reasons so it's so important that we understand mental health so we can really support them uh, through yoga and this is not something that's taught in yoga teacher training courses i'm on a mission to change that but for now this is not taught in our general 200 hour yoga teacher training courses and we need to really educate ourselves and um, um, so we can really support our students so thank you if you're interested mm -hmm. you know you will find the description how to know more about lauren and the courses that uh, she offers everything is there in the description on the website and uh, we thank you so much lauren for uh, being with us sharing this time with us and giving us a little bit of insight on mental health aware yoga for all practitioners yoga teachers we also have lots of we have lots of free resources on our website as well at mentalhealthawareyoga.com on the blog there's lots of free resources there to get started so thank you very much lauren for your time thank you for being with us have a very great day thank you for having me